are live. I'm testing it out here on my phone tonight to see if I can find myself. And uh, it might jump on here that there are some looking for us tonight around this time and some who are just stumbling on, which is quite fine. Uh, let me see. Can I share this? I don't know. As you can tell, Marcy is usually the one here helping me, but she is not on tonight with me. Uh, she's tied up, and much like a lot of you have things going on in the summer, uh, don't seem like this is going to work. So yeah, she's away tonight, not with me, and uh, she said the last time that uh, I did my own video here on my own, it was the lowest views that we had had. Can you believe that? So hopefully that's not the case again tonight or it'll certainly prove a pattern. So stay on with me tonight and um, join along in this study on Daniel's prophecies. Actually this will be our last lesson if you can believe that. Uh, some of you might be <laughs> happy about that. It's been six weeks uh, waiting our way through the prophecies in, in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And uh, tonight we get to the end. And so uh, I hope you're ready to finish things off here, finish strong. Uh, I really should jump into it because there is a lot of ground to cover tonight. But uh, grab your tea or coffee. I have mine. Grab your Bibles or your phone, your app, your device, whatever you're going to follow along with because there's a lot of reading we need to do tonight. And uh, yeah, let's start off with a prayer together. Ask God for his help tonight. Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you for each one that have joined us along this journey and how you've been speaking to our hearts. I pray tonight that we would once again open up our hearts and minds to hear what your word would say to us, to teach us and to prepare us for what lies ahead. Help us not to be fearful. Help us not to be wavering in our faith, but to trust in you completely and to know that you have a great future and a great plan for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So yeah, jump on and uh, make a comment. Let us know you're watching. And uh, just if you have a question or something, a comment as we get into tonight's readings. Uh, feel free to write something in. We'll get back to you after uh, we air the video here live. So uh, we've had some great comments and great questions messaged in after. Appreciate those and appreciate everybody that's been uh, joining along with us on our study. In case I forget to mention too, the plan will be um, we'll probably take a break next week and just regroup and figure out where we're going to go next. As far as our midweek studies, uh, we love that people are joining us, and so it's great. Even in the summer, and I know many people are busy and they catch up later. So, so we will come back. might take us a week or two, but we will jump back on with a great study again uh, in the midweek. We'll give you some more information on that, but we'll take at least a break for one week so we can regroup and regather and look for some uh, new material to share with you. Daniel's prophecies, we are going to be in Daniel chapter 10, and we actually will cover three chapters tonight. So this is, in fact, the fourth and final vision recorded uh, in the book of Daniel that Daniel receives. And so it takes place about a couple of years after the vision that we studied last week of the 70 weeks. So a couple of years later... This is the fourth vision recorded by Daniel that he receives, and so we're going to look at that, and that will take us to the conclusion tonight. Now, like some of the other prophecies, uh, this one, some of it is, has already been fulfilled. History will bear out that some of what Daniel had seen in this vision comes to pass, and so we'll quickly glide through some of that again tonight. And then it also will show that there are parts of this vision that we're going to read tonight that have yet to be fulfilled. So much like some of the other visions, that's exactly how this one works. So let's begin uh, by Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 1. I want to read to you the first 
chapter here, the 10th chapter, the first one of our three tonight, and then we'll pause and look at where we are. So it says, in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. Now, when this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time I had eaten no rich food, no meat, no wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. On April 23rd, I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, and I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem, and his face flashed like lightning. His eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified, and they ran away to hide. I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me, and I heard the man speak, and I heard the sound of his voice, and I fainted and laid there with my face to the ground. Then a hand touched me and lifted me, and still trembling to my hands and knees, the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. Listen carefully to what I have to say. Stand up. I have been sent to you. And when he said this, I stood up, still trembling. Verse 12, he said, don't be afraid. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I've come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And now I'm here to explain that what will happen to your people in the future for this vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was speaking to me, I looked down at the ground, unable to say a word, and then the one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing in front of me, I am filled with anguish because of the vision that I've seen, my Lord, and I am very weak. How could someone like me, your servant, talk to you? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. And then the one who looked like a man touched me again and I felt my strength return. Don't be afraid, he said. You are very precious to God. Peace, be encouraged, be strong. As he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, Please speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. He replied, Do you know why I've come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, and after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece. Meanwhile, I'll tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. I've been standing beside Michael to support and strengthen him since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. All right, pause, pause, pause for a moment. Here's what we just uncovered in reading Daniel chapter 10. Daniel is greatly concerned for God's people and for his people, the Jewish people. He mourns and fasts and prays for three weeks, it says. And then at the end of that time, he has this vision. And described for us is this man that he sees. And some say that this vision, this person, this persona, is in fact Gabriel, whom he'd already seen in a vision. It's very possible. It doesn't tell us that either way. Others believe that this description represents uh, the glorified Christ. And so, of course, Daniel, uh, this Christ wouldn't have come <laughs> until some hundreds of years later. But uh, Daniel describes this figure in any case, whomever it is. And when he appears and Daniel hears his voice, he's so overwhelmed, he falls to the ground. It says that his companions who are with him don't see or hear the, the person, the figure that's speaking, but they're terrified and they run away. They run in terror. So we have this 
then this description given from Daniel 10, verse 12, all the way to the end of the chapter, which is talking a lot about a spiritual battle. And for some who might be joining us tonight, that may be very unfamiliar territory to you. We haven't talked a lot about the spiritual realm in our study of Daniel. This is almost the first time we really get into this, how there are these angelic figures, as is described here, Michael is named particularly, and if this is Gabriel the angel, then we know there's another at least. But there are these spiritual figures involved in battle with what is we just read are prince, princes of Persia, which is a, a real empire at the time, Greece, which would be another empire soon to come. So there's this, this spiritual component and battle being referred to here that Daniel is finding out about. He's getting this peek behind the curtain a little bit of what is going on in a spiritual realm and how it's so significant that, that it took the full three weeks for this, this figure to even get to Daniel to reveal to him this dream. And so, very interesting. I won't go too far down that road tonight, but uh, suffice to say that it opens our eyes a little bit here in the reading as to some of what goes on spiritually behind empires and rulers and kings and powers that God is at work with. So verse 12 and 13 that we just read in Daniel 10 describes an, a demonic force or an evil force that is at work within the Persian rule, within the Persian government. And at that time, they are the ones ruling over the exiles, the, the Jewish people that, that includes Daniel. And we see how Michael, the archangel described here and referred to in many places in scripture, is a part of this battle, as I said. Now, we got down to verse 20 and 21, and this, this messenger mentions that he'd been part of the battle even from the time when he assisted Darius the Mede. So when we review back over our history and some of the era that we've covered already in the book of Daniel, we would know that Darius was a ruler that was favorable to the Jewish people. He allowed them to return to their own land, as a matter of fact, and rebuild the temple walls at Jerusalem. So the mention of the Prince of Greece that comes right in and around those same verses begins to allow us to put together some of the history of how Greece then would be involved in the future events. So there's a lot that gets painted for us here in this first bit of this vision. We haven't actually gotten to it yet, but that is how we set the scene, how Daniel first encounters this, this man, this, this great messenger. All right, let's keep reading. Uh, let's get into chapter 11. Let me refuel for a minute. All right, follow along, because now... There is going to be a lot that, that comes out in uh, the next couple of chapters for us and, and for our futures, actually. So this is going to be very interesting. Okay, follow along from chapter 11. It says, Now then I will reveal the truth to you. Three more Persian kings will reign to be succeeded by a fourth, far richer than the others, and he will use his wealth to stir up everyone to fight against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will rise to power, who will rule with great authority and accomplish everything he sets out to do. But at the height of his power, his kingdom will be broken and divided into four parts. We've already talked about some of this. It will not be ruled by the king's descendants, nor will the kingdom hold the authority it once had. For his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will increase in power, but one of his own officials will become more powerful than him and will rule his kingdom with great strength. Some years later, an alliance will be formed between the king of the north and the king of the south. The daughter of the king of the south will be given in marriage to the king of the north to secure the alliance, but she will lose her influence over him and so will her father. 
She'll be abandoned along with her supporters, but when one of her relatives becomes king of the south, he will raise an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and defeat him. Sounds like Game of Thrones is happening here, but it's not, okay? We're, we're working through Daniel 11. Okay, verse 8. When he returns to Egypt, he will carry back their idols with him, along with priceless articles of gold and silver. Some years later, he will leave the king of the north alone. And later, the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will soon return to his own land. However, the sons of the king of the north will assemble a mighty army that will advance like a flood and carry the battle as far as the enemy's fortress. Then, in a rage, the king of the south will rally against the vast forces assembled by the king of the north and will defeat them. After the enemy is swept away, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will execute many thousands of his enemies. But his success will be short-lived. A few years later, the king of the north will return with a fully equipped army far greater than before. And at that time, there will be a general uprising against the king of the south. Violent men among your own people will join them in fulfillment of this vision, but they will not succeed. Then the king of the north will come and lay siege to a fortified city and capture it. The best troops of the south will not be able to stand in the face of the onslaught. The king of the north will march onward up unopposed, and none will be able to stop him. He will pause in the glorious land of Israel, intent on destroying it. He will make plans to come with the might of his entire kingdom and form an alliance with the king of the south. He will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom from within, but his plan will fail. And after this, he will return to his attention to the coastland and conquer many cities, but a commander from another land will put an end to his insolence and cause him to retreat in shame. He'll take refuge in his own fortress, but will stumble and fall and be seen no more. You still with me? We're at verse 20. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor, but after a very brief reign, he will die, though not from anger or in battle. The next to come in power will be a, des a despicable man who is not in line for royal succession. He will slip in when least expected and take over the kingdom by flattery and intrigue. Before him, great armies will be swept away, including a covenant prince. With deceitful promises, he will make various alliances and become strong despite having only a handful of followers. Without warning, he will enter the richest areas of the land and will distribute among his followers the plunder and wealth of the rich. Something his predecessors had never done. He will plod through the overthrow of strongholds, but this will last only a short while. He'll stir up his courage and raise a great army against the king of the south. The king of the south will go to battle with a mighty army, but to no avail. There will be plots against him. His own household will cause his downfall. His army will be swept away and many will be killed seeking nothing but each other's harm. These kings will plot against each other at the conference table, attempting to deceive each other, but it will make no difference, for the end will come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return home with great riches and on the way will set himself against the people of the Holy Covenant, doing much damage before continuing his journey. And then at the appointed time, he will once again invade the south. This time, the results will be different. Warships from western coastlands will scare him off and he will withdraw and return home. He'll vent his anger against the people of the Holy Covenant and reward those who forsake the covenant. His army will take over the temple fortress, pollute the sanctuary, put a stop to the daily sacrifices and set up the sacrilegious object that causes desecration. He'll flatter and win over those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will be strong and resist him. It's an important verse, Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. 
Wise leaders will give instruction to many, but these teachers will die by fire and sword, or they'll be jailed and robbed. During these persecutions, little help will arrive, and many who join them will not be sincere. Some of them, wise, will fall victim to persecution and made in this way, they will be refined and cleansed and made pure until the time of the end. For the appointed time is still to come. The king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. He will succeed only until the time of wrath is completed. Now we're talking about things that have yet to happen, okay? Just in case I've lost you along the way here. We'll, we'll go back over in a minute. What has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors or for the god loved by women or for other gods, or he will boast that he is greater than all of them. Instead of these, he will worship the god of fortresses, a god of ancestors never knew, and lavish on him gold, silver, precious stones, and expensive gifts, claiming this foreign God's help, he will attack the strongest fortresses. He will honor those who submit to him, appointing them to positions of authority and dividing the land among them as their reward. At the time of the end, the king of the south will attack the king of the north. The king of the north will storm out with chariots, charioteers, and a vast army. He will invade various lands and sweep them through them like a flood. He will enter the glorious land of Israel, and many nations will fall, but Moab, Edom, and the best part of Ammon will escape. He will conquer many countries, and even Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over gold, silver, and the treasures of Egypt, and the Libyans and Ethiopians will be his servants. Then news from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in great anger to destroy and obliterate many. He'll stop between the glorious holy mountain and the sea and will pitch his royal tents. But while he's still there, his time will suddenly run out and no one will help him. Okay, let's pause again. And I know that that took a while. <laughs> I was going quick. But because I just wanted to cover it and uh, give you the chance to hear it read right through, I thought about paring it down a little bit, but I think it's important for us to see that God's word goes into such great detail. And if we really spent the time, we would see and piece this together in, in the course of history, how all of what has been described for us had come true. So let me just give you the, the reader's digest and you are welcome, and I encourage you to dig in on your own and uh, and check out some of the facts and the history behind what I'm sharing with you tonight. But here we begin by being by being told of this vision, how it reveals future events, which focuses on the Persian and the Greek empires, particularly how their rule would affect the Jewish people and their homeland. That, that's the gist of the message that Daniel's getting. And it told us that three kings would come to power, and between Cyrus and Xerxes, which are, is what we're talking about here, we can look back and piece that together from history. Xerxes would raise up a vast army which would conquer Greece, but he also suffered two major defeats in two years, which ended his campaign in history. But the vision shifts and we read here and and this kind of tracks with what we've also studied in a previous lesson that the rise of alexander the great which was from lesson five uh, after his death which is also referred to in this vision again the empire greek empire would be divided among four of his generals two of those kingdoms in particular would affect the course of Jewish history. And that is the, the Ptolemies in Egypt, if I'm saying it right, and the Seleucids in Syria. These two kingdoms would control Israel until the Maccabean revolt. So when we read down through chapter 11 and we got to verse 21, the vision describes again for us another, the same character we've studied in another vision, which is Antiochus the fourth 
how he would enjoy great military and political success and it would largely come through deception which and intrigue which we just read in, in Daniel 11. It also would tell us again here in the vision how this ruler would plunder and desecrate Jerusalem and the temple and disrupt Jewish worship and make the worship of the one true God of the Jewish people near impossible. So all of that is revealed to Daniel uh, hundreds of years before it ever takes place. Antiochus, based on what we know in history, would look to conquest in Egypt, which is also described here, but he would be unsuccessful. And so he ends up taking out his frustration on the Jewish people by various methods of persecution. Then we got to Daniel 11, verse 36. I, I alluded to it as we were reading through that now the vision, the focus shifts from things that have already happened for us in hindsight to things that will happen in the future. And it points again to an individual and revelation when John records it in the last book of the Bible, the, Re the book of Revelations, it tells us there is this antichrist, this ruler that rises up in the tribulation period. Daniel is seeing that here in Daniel 11, verse 36, 37, how he will be a king, a ruler, but he will also profess to be a god. So this is something many believe we may see in our lifetime. That may be the case. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it is very possible that the things that have been revealed through these, these prophecies could come true in, in at any time. And the Antichrist, as described for us here, that, we're, that we begin to, to get some information on from this messenger, it tells us that he will enjoy a time of success and he will reward those who work for him, who serve him, in verses 38 and 39. It also tells us, if we are to piece together the clues here and the hints to help us to have understanding and, and, and of this revelation, of this vision, that the Antichrist will occupy the Holy Land and he will dominate other countries. He'll gain control of their resources. That was what we read in verses 40 through 43. It, it talks about here how the armies of the East and the North will engage in a series of battles. And verse 45 is where we just stopped our reading, tells us and describes for us a, a, a battle that ends all battles, if you will. The Revelation describes it even more particularly of the battle of Armageddon. It's the, the battle that ends the great tribulation. Uh, Revelation 19, by the way, is, is where you would read about that. It describes how Jesus would return to defeat this antichrist ruler and his armies. So this all takes place in the future at some point, and it's not because I'm predicting it or trying to go out on a limb and pretend that I have some great insight. I'm sharing from God's word what we believe to be true and will yet to happen. And now we are going to basically read through Daniel 12. So again, stick with me here just for a few moments in closing. The vision continues to reveal things that are yet to come, the time of the end. And so I hope you find this to be interesting and encouraging to you. And uh, it's something that we can certainly humbly accept in our hearts and trust God through. So let's read it together and then we'll be at the end of our study. It says in verse 1, Daniel 12, that at the time Michael the archangel who stands guard over your nation will arise and there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. That's a pretty bold statement when you think of it. At that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those 
whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end. And when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and saw two others standing on opposite banks of the river. One of them asked the man dressed in linen, who was now standing above the river, how long will it be until these shocking events are over? The man dressed in linen who was standing above the river raised both hands towards heaven and he took a solemn oath by the one who lives forever, saying, It will go on for a time, times, and half a time. When the shattering of the holy people has finally come to an end, all these things will have happened. I heard what he said, but I didn't understand what he meant, so I asked, How long will all the, all this finally end, my Lord. And he said, Go, Daniel, for what I have said is kept secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined by these trials. But the wicked will continue in their wickedness. None of them will understand, and only those who are wise will know what it means. From the time the daily sacrifices stopped and the sacrilegious object that causes desecration is set up to be worshipped, there will be 1290 days. Blessed are those who wait and remain until the end of the 1335 days. As for you, go your way until the end. You will rest and then at the end of the days you will rise again to receive the inheritance that is set aside for you. And that's the end of Daniel 12. All right, let me let me try to piece that together for you in closing here tonight. Basically, what we just read as we put it in context of Daniel's uh, chapters 10, 11, 12, it says that the vision continues and Daniel sees now two other men we don't know who these individuals are either, and they're standing on either side of the river. And one of them asks the question, when will all of this take place? Fair question. We all would, we all would want to know. And the answer comes, it will be a time, times, and half a time. Sounds like a bit of a riddle, but of course Daniel is in the same boat. He doesn't understand what all of that means and what the vision is meant to teach us. So he, he, in a sense, affirms that he would remain faithful to the Lord and trust God to fulfill what he has said he would do. Now, Daniel 12 and verse 11 speaks of, again, this the, the desecration, the daily temple sacrifices, how they would be stopped for a period, and it sets up what Revelation refers to as the abomination of desolation. So now we're jumping the tracks a little bit to get into more end-time study through the book of Revelation. But other scriptures indicate to us, in support of this prophecy in Daniel, that uh, this takes place three and a half years into the tribulation period when the Jewish people will be openly attacked by the Antichrist. Verse 11 states it as 1290 days. So three and a half years into the tribulation period, which is the end time period that we refer to in scripture, it tells us that this will take place, this this stopping of worship in the Jewish temple and this the beginning of persecution of the Jewish people. And verse 12 then, it right after what we just read in verse 11, says those who survive this time would be blessed. 
and it refers to 1,335 days. Now there's no explanation given for the extra 45 days, so there's lots of speculation. Uh, some would relate it to Revelation 19, again referring now to the book of Revelations at the end of the Bible, where it talks about a period of time which is used to set up the kingdom after the Antichrist is defeated. So you have your three and a half years and then potentially a, a 45 day window to set up the kingdom that Christ promises. That could be, but there's no no way to certainly know here the difference between the two references. But in any case, we follow the vision through and the book of Daniel closes on a positive note. It's full of warnings. It's full of truth and judgment in many cases. Some of you have referred to that in your comments to us. And at the same time, there's lots of references here of hope and faithfulness and God's patience and mercy. So Daniel, the ref reference at the end of this is that Daniel would remain faithful and that he would die before these visions would come to pass. It's been many, many years since Daniel's passed and they have yet to come to pass. But he could trust in God's promise that one day he himself would be resurrected and experience eternal life. And so if I'm Daniel, after living this incredible life, some of which we've just touched on the highlights as we've gone through this prophecy study, seeing God speak and move to rulers and kings, and for Daniel to have recorded such incredible insight into times that have now unfolded, we can look back and see it clearly, but things that have yet to unfold that then he can rest in being in that he's been faithful to what God has called him to do and that one day he has the same promise you and I have which is to spend eternity with Christ these prophecies in closing they warn us of the last days and that those that period of tribulation when the antichrist will rule will be a terrible and a perilous time and we're just scratching the surface of that conversation but it's very obvious to us through this study as we've touched on it that that's not an enjoyable era in the history of mankind and so first john 4 and 3 is a reference you might want to look up yourself it refers to the fact that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world. That there is this, when we talk about from Daniel 10, this spiritual battle, there is a spiritual battle right now in our world where there are spiritual forces wanting to, to pull us as, as people from pursuing and seeking God. That's an antichrist type spirit that wants to wants to desecrate the name of God, the true and living God, and and keep people from seeking him and searching for him. So rather than cower in fear or compromise our beliefs as followers of Jesus, we should stand courageous as Daniel and his friends did throughout this book we've been reading and studying. And we should stand up for what we believe and stand up for the truth of God's word. By God's grace, we can live a life that is godly, even in an ungodly world, even with an ungodly government or ruler or king, just like Daniel in his time had to do. And so we can apply that exact same conviction in our own lives. We can proclaim the gospel, the truth of God's promises to the ends of the earth as we look forward to Christ's return. And that's a promise that's been given even by Jesus himself when he went away, that he would come back. So we continue to watch and pray and wait for that day and understand that everything that God has set into motion 
will one day come to pass. Trust in that, not be afraid, and share the great hope we have with all those we meet. All right, I hope you've been blessed by the study, and I thank you for your patience tonight as we've gone a little bit over time. But God bless you. Have a, a great rest of this week. And again, we won't see you next week, Wednesday, but uh, watch the Facebook page, and uh, we'll be sure to get back to you with some information. All right, talk to you later.